How many of you have a copy of the Word of God with you this evening? All right, if you do, let's go ahead and turn together to Psalm 97. Psalm 97, uh, this has been our uh, summer focus, summer psalms. We've been looking at book four uh, and really uh, looking at select psalms, but we've almost walked straight through. Uh, they have just been uh, a wonderful focus, particularly on our worship over the last several weeks, uh, beginning in, in chapter 95 and really going through chapter 100. We're going to look at Psalm 97 tonight, and uh, you, it's not hard, not difficult to see the theme of our songs uh, this evening as we focus on the reign, the rule, uh, the sovereignty of our God. And uh, as we come to Psalm 97, it's similar t- uh, to 96 that we don't know uh, the author, we don't know the circumstances surrounding Uh, Tradition seems to lean towards David being the author of Psalm 97. That seems to fit well with uh, the focus here. But we can't be clear or sure about that. But let's do this. Let's let's go ahead and read through together. uh, Have a word of prayer and then we'll we'll jump into this. Psalm 97. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. His lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and all the people see his glory. All worshipers of images are put to shame who make their boast in worthless idols. Worship him, all you gods. Zion hears and is glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. For you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. O you who love the Lord, hate evil. He preserves the lives of his saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, and give thanks to his holy name. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight uh, for the the privilege it is to gather in your house to freely worship you. Uh, Lord, that is a privilege that not everyone enjoys. Uh, A time that we can gather in the open with our brothers and sisters and fellowship together and sing your praises and Lord, bear one another's burdens. And Lord, I I thank you tonight for answered prayer. Lord, there's been many praises this evening. And Lord, we know that all healing, all health, every answer comes from you. And at the same time, we stop and we look to you and we come before your throne, knowing that we can find help in time of need because we have a great high priest who intercedes on our behalf. And we ask, Lord, that you would move on behalf of those who are dealing with uh, with sickness and hurt. And, and we pray for healing, Lord. We pray for strength. And Lord, we pray for those who are struggling, Lord, maybe discouraged, down. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would be round about them. And Lord, may they experience your presence. Even now at this very moment, you know the hearts, you know the need. And we pray that you would just come about them. and uh, Lord, give them your peace, uh, Lord, that, it, that comes from you alone. I thank you for your word tonight, or just how it makes sense of um, of the world we live in. Uh, you know, as always, my need. I know that apart from you, I can do nothing. And Lord, when it comes to the subject of your sovereignty, Lord, uh, my mind is not adequate to comprehend all that that means. And so I pray that you would move by your spirit um, to open our eyes more to who you are to understand more of your majesty and your glory, that we might live in a way that's pleasing to you, Father. Lord, we leave this time in your hands, asking you to accomplish your good purposes, and we pray and ask it in in the name of Jesus. And amen. Our point, our our, our first point is just, is is very clear and very straightforward. It's it's, uh, right there in verse 1. The Lord reigns. The Lord reigns reigns uh the the word means he is king uh but it, it, it in the hebrew it's it's perfect and, and not not perfect tense we don't have they don't have tenses like we do in the greek or in, in or in english but in the hebrew perfect has the idea of 
um, completeness or entirety. And so when it says the Lord reigns, it means that he reigns completely. Right? And, and, and so he, when, when we see in the scripture, it says he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. We understand that to mean that he rules and reigns over all things. Now, you can, you can hear that, and we can read that, and we can go, yep, yep, that's true. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and we can kind of receive that in a ho-hum kind of, yep, that, that's God, right? God is God. He's in control. He is king. But stop and think about what that means. The Lord reigns. That means that nothing happens in this universe without his permission or that's outside of his control are you with me everything that happens he's sovereign over it's not merely that he has the power or the right but he always exercises that power he's sovereign over everything and there's no there's no molecule in the universe that acts outside of his sovereign rule That means he's sovereign over your life and my life and that there's nothing too big or too small for his attention. You know, God's not just simply interested in the big things of our life. He is, he's part of every part, right? Every single moment, every single little bit, nothing is outside of his control. You say, how how far, how far does his sovereign reign extend? You, you hear it. He, he reigns over all things. You know, Proverbs says the, the heart of the king is in his hand. Right, so there's, there's no ruler. There's no ruler on this earth that can act outside of God's sovereign plan. Even the roll of the dice, according to Proverbs 16.33. You know, what we would consider chance, God is behind. He's in control of. Now, all right, so we go from ho-hum, right? God's in control, yes, to, wait a minute, God's in control of everything? That there's, there's nothing that is outside of his control that, that he hasn't allowed or he hasn't permitted? And then we go from maybe ho-hum to, I don't know how I, how I feel about that. I mean, I, that can be a bit unsettling, can it not? Why is that? Why is it so unsettling, this, this idea that God has complete and total sovereignty? It is a little, isn't it? I, I, I think two reasons. Right? Number one, I think we, we don't like the idea of anyone having control, right? We want to have control. <laughs> we want to rule. We want to reign in our lives. You know, we want to you know, have all the balls in our hand. And so the idea that somebody else is ruling and reigning and controlling things doesn't sit very well with our selfish hearts. Right? And, and, and you know, that expresses in different ways. You know, I mean, we got some control freaks in here, right? You know, some of you, are, 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 you, you want to keep all that. And, and so the idea that, that God is in control can, can be unsettling. That's not the only reason, is it? The other reason why it doesn't necessarily sit well with us is because it doesn't necessarily fit with what we see. When you look at the world that we live in, it doesn't always look like God's in control. Bad things happen. Horrid, evil, wicked things happen. I mean... Natural disaster wipes out thousands upon thousands of people. God alone allows and permits these things. You, we have war and terrorism that add to that tally every single day. Uh, there's sex trafficking and abuse that is commonplace in the world that we live in. 
We live in a world where we see wicked and evil every single day, and yet we're saying that God's in control, that he allows, that he permits all things. And you know, it's not just that bad things happen, but bad things happen to good people, right? to, to people who love him, to people who know him. I, I read last week, uh, it, just, it broke my heart uh, about a family who was uh, on their way to Japan on the mission field. They love the Lord. They want to serve the Lord, right? This is a family of five. Mom and dad, 29, 3-year-old, 24-month-old, and a 2-month-old. Right? They're traveling from Minnesota to Colorado, and on their way, a semi just plows right through their vehicle. And all five of them go off into eternity. In just, in just two months, they were going to be in Japan sharing the gospel with people. And their lives are gone. Why would God allow that? You know, sometimes, sometimes it's easier for us to think that nobody's in control than to think that someone's in control. That's why we have those, you know, these different philosophies, these different beliefs, right? You know, there's, there's deism that believes, yes, there's a God, but he just started all things and then kind of let it loose, right? <laughs> and, and then there's, there's fatalism, right? I mean, everything's meaningless. There's naturalism. Our hope is in the world we see around us and, and nature itself. And you know, there's even what they call open theism. Yes, there's a God, but he can't know everything. He can't control everything. All of those thoughts and all those, don't, they don't line up with what we see here in the Word. The Lord reigns fully, completely over all things. And when you understand that, then the question is what? How can God allow that? How can God permit these terrible things? Is he really in control? And the answer, without fail, when you open up the scripture, is yes. Yes. Without fail. Listen to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel 4.35. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? You know what Daniel's saying? He's God. He's going to do what he wants. And there's no one who has a right to question that. <laughs> that doesn't sit well with us. Right? That, that doesn't, we don't like that. But what do you see in Psalm 97? The Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. And what I want you to see tonight is the, the reality, the truth that the Lord reigns over all gives us great hope. It helps us to understand and make sense of the sinful, sick world that we live in. And we do. So notice, notice the... The, the, the truth that God rules and reigns is not meant to unsettle you. The truth that God rules and reigns is not meant to make you say, God, I don't understand. I don't know why. It's not meant to confuse. Notice the psalmist says, the Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the coastlands, the many coastlands be glad. What's he saying here? Let all the earth rejoice in the fact that God is sovereign. That he's ruling, that he is reigning. This is, a, this is a matter of worship. Here the psalmist is saying, don't let it unsettle you. Don't let it confuse you. Rejoice that God is reigning. Rejoice that he is on the throne. Now, he, says, he, he begins to explain, right? Explain why. Why do we rejoice in this? Well, verse 2, he says, rejoice because the clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. All right, clouds and thick darkness. Right? There's, there's something, there's, there's a bit of mystery here. Remember, this is poetic language, right? Now, people have kind of interpreted that lots of different ways, but I think that we see here there's some uncertainty. There's a mystery. There's, there's, there's something we can't fully see. The, the truth is, is we're not going to fully understand 
how God is working, right? His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Now, all right, so we may not fully understand, but we do know this, what? He is righteous and just. So even though we don't necessarily understand why things happen, we know, we know that he is right and he's going to set all things right. Okay? So the idea that the Lord reigns over all things doesn't mean that he's reigning just right now, but he has always reigned and he will always reign. And the reality is we see this, this sovereign God is righteous and he is just. And he knows. He knows what you cannot know. I, I, heard, I heard an illustration this week that, um, that helped me just kind of think through that, right? This, there's a lady who's, who's taking her very first airplane flight. She's flying into Chicago Airport, and the fog is out, thick, heavy. They said c- coming into Chicago, <laughs> the fog was so thick that you couldn't see the Sears Tower. Right? And she's looking out the window of the airplane, and what's she thinking? I can't see anything. If I can't see anything, <laughs> then the pilot can't see anything, right? That's, that's what's going through her head. And so she's starting to panic a little bit, and she's going, if I can't see, can he see? And the lady in front of her turns around and says, no, he can't see any more than you can. But he knows where he's going. He has something he can see what she cannot see because of the instruments and the panels. and right. He has a control tower and all of those things that are bringing them in safely so he sees what she doesn't see. And we have a God who sees what we do not see. Right? And, and, and so he's ruling and he's reigning. And we may not always understand why these things are happening. They do happen, right? And God allows them. He, he permits them to happen. And we can't. We, we, don't try and, we don't try and take away from that, because if we take away from that, we take away from his character and his sovereignty. I mean, we, we, in Romans chapter 9, it says, Scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Pharaoh, the one who enslaved God's people for 400 years, that Pharaoh, God raised up. God allowed to reign. For his glory. And God was glorified in it by delivering his people out of slavery and by miraculously saving them. Right? God was glorified through that. Hey, think, about, think about the life of Joseph. Right? In the end, there's, there's Joseph standing before his brothers and he looks at them and he says, what? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Right? And they did. They wanted to kill him. And then they sold him into slavery. But all along, God was working, even through their sin, through their wickedness, to save his people in the end. And so, God's sovereignty doesn't negate man's responsibility or man's free will or choice. Right? God has created, he's created us with the ability, the freedom to choose how we're going to live our lives. And in that freedom, God is still sovereignly working. You say, how does that work? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't. I can't explain how that works, but it works. His ways are higher than our ways. I mean, there's, the secret things belong to the Lord. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Yes, he is reigning. He is ruling sovereignly over all things. And yes, we are free to choose to live for him or not to rebel or sin against him. But understand, this is the fundamental claim of what it means to be a Christian is to recognize him as Lord. To come to a place in in our life where we say, I'm not in control. I have rebelled. I have sinned against the king. I deserve his punishment. And yet, oh, the king has moved graciously to save us. And so, right, if we confess in our heart, the Lord Jesus, and believe in our heart, with our mouth, the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So we, we come to this place where we, we bow our knee before the Lord Jesus Christ and we experience life. And, and this is a continual 
process for us as his people, right? Because we're constantly trying to step back on to the throne. And so we're, we're continuing to have to say, no, that's not my place. It's your place, Lord. You are reigning, not only in all creation, but you're reigning in my life. And I'm rejoicing in that. Not only because, not only because he's righteous and just, but notice, rejoice because, verse 3, this is, this is very striking when you read it. Rejoice because fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. Did you catch that? Rejoice because God is going to burn up his adversaries. Why do we rejoice in that? Because it just brings us back to that reality that God is going to set all things right. No wicked deed will go unpunished. Right? All of the abuse, all of the wickedness, all of the, the rebellion, all of it will come under his sovereign divine judgment. He's going to righteously judge all sin and we can rejoice in that and some of you are going is that right for me is that right for me to rejoice yes it's right for us to 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 know and and to be thankful that god's going to deal with sin some of you know exactly what this feels like because some of you have been hurt abused mistreated in a way that is so wicked and despicable Nobody else really can understand or grasp what you're going through. I've talked to to young young ladies who've been who've been abused, who've experienced that. Sometimes to the point where nothing was done about it. Everything was hidden, swept under the rug, left in secret. How do you handle that? How do you deal with that? You come to Psalm 97 and you say what? (laughs) You say God's going to burn up all his adversaries. Yeah, maybe they swept it under the rug. Maybe it didn't, but God won't let it go unpunished. And so for those who experience injustice and hurt, Psalm 97 is a great hope. It's a great encouragement to your heart knowing that Lord, the Lord is reigning and he's going to set all things right. So we rejoice. Verses 4 through 6, his his lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. The imagery here is what? Nothing can stop this king. The mountains melt like wax before him. The, The strongest fortifications cannot stop him when he comes to reign and rule and to to meet out his righteous judgment nothing will stand in his way all the earth will recognize and glory you realize that in god's wrath in his judgment he will be glorified by all peoples not just those who know and love him but by all peoples. There is coming a day when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He will get the glory in the end. Now, here's the thing. The reality of this divine judgment moves the psalmist to plead with the ungodly. You see it? Look at verse 7. All the worshipers of images are put to shame who make their boast in worthless idols. Worship him, all you gods. Here's a a plea. God's judgment is certain. If you're worshiping anything, anything else but Him, turn away from that. Repent and worship Him. Because any other worship is worthless. And and we we spent some time looking at in Psalm 96, and we're not going to spend a great deal on that because... Again, right, verse 5 of Psalm 96, all the gods of people are worthless idols. Worthless. But understand this. The reality of God's judgment should move us to plead with the lost. Understanding that God is going to deal with all sin, it should move us to plead with sinners. 
that old uh, Princeton theologian, A.A. A. Hodge, he said, a man who believes in hell won't shut up about it, but will speak about it with all tenderness and earnestness and urgency. If we truly believe that God is reigning and he's going to judge all sin, then it should move us to plead with those who are perishing. The founder of the Salvation Army, William Booth, he said this, most Christians would like to send their recruits to Bible college. I'd like to send them to hell for five minutes. That would do more than anything else to prepare them for a lifetime of compassionate ministry. See what he's saying? If we just get a grasp, a glimpse of the full weight of the wrath of God, then it would move us with compassion to reach those who are heading there. And so in that moment, the psalmist is just pleading with the lost. Worship him. Turn away from your sin and turn away from your worthless idols. And then in verse 8, Zion hears and is glad. And the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. For you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. You see, God's people rejoice in this truth. God's people rejoice in his right judgment. This is a right response, knowing that God is going to judge, knowing that he's going to set all things right. What hope this brings to those who are experiencing persecution, to those who are going through hurt and pain and loss, to know there's a God who's in control. Understanding that God reigns, will stir something up in your heart. But if, if, you truly, if you truly believe that God reigns, then it helps us make sense. It helps us make sense of our hurt and our pain and our loss. If we believe that God reigns, then we believe Romans 8.28, that, that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. So, If we believe that God is reigning and he's going to set all things right, then we're going to believe that that family of five that perished, that God was working through that to bring about good and glory. And that may not be clearly evident, but if you fail to believe that God reigns, then what happens? Then you're left to be angry and bitter. And so we set our hope in this. We set our hope in, a, in, in the God who is on the throne. We rejoice that the Lord is king because we know that he is good and he is righteous and he is just in his dealings with his people. And then the last thing we see, right, because the Lord reigns and he's altogether righteous, we see how it affects his people. Look at verse 10. Oh, you who love the Lord. Hate evil. Hate evil. Now, again, there's a word that we don't associate with God very often. Hate. But for those of us who love God, that means that we love what he loves, but it also means we hate what he hates. Okay. Well, what does God hate? Listen to, listen to Psalm chapter 5. Psalm chapter 5 and verse 4 through 6. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. For those of us who know and love the Lord, there's going to be a growing hate in us for Sin for wickedness, for evil. When we see it, it's going to stir a hatred. Now, you say, I'm supposed to hate? And we we wrestle with that, right? Even in our love, right? Even in our love, right? Jesus said, I'm supposed to love my enemies. Even in your love, there's a hatred, right? Even in, right, we we mentioned, right? We we mentioned some despicable abuse, right? You know, sex offenders and, and, and terrorists and, even in our love for them, we hate what sin brings about. 
in their life. Right? <laughs> we, I mean, you, you see Christ on the cross. Father, forgive them. They, knew, they, they know not what they do. There's, there's a love and a tenderness and a compassion, and yet there's a hatred for the sin that places him on that cross. And so there's not a, there's no, there's no struggle here between the love and the hate. They both exist together. The reality is, is that that hatred of evil, that hatred of sin should start first in our own heart and life. Do you hate the sin that's in you? Now, the reality is for us as people that we're going to sin, right? We still live in the flesh. We're going to have this struggle. But it should be a fight. And we should hate it. <laughs> we should go to the Lord and tell him, I hate this. I hate this in me. You know, take it away from me. Forgive me. I'm turning away from it. And, and we may fall. We may fail. But there's going to be that fight. There's going to be a hatred of what we're battling and fighting against. Oh, you who love the Lord, hate evil. And those who love him, it says he preserves the lives of his saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. And you read that and you say, not always. Right? Maybe you're not. Maybe that's just me, right? He preserves the lives of his saints. We just read about a car wreck where five of his saints, we, you know, we see daily where his people are, their, their heads are being cut off. They're, they're being killed for their faith. He preserves the lives of his saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Yeah, ultimately. What do you see in Revelation? You see the, you see the martyred saints around his throne saying, Lord, when's that day coming? And it comes. It comes in Revelation 19. See, Ultimately, the reign of the Lord points us beyond just this life to eternity itself. And in the end, he preserves the lives of his saints and delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. And light is sown for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. He's going to lead. He's going to guide. He's going to direct his people. And the only proper response to God's righteous reign, verse 12, rejoice in the Lord. Oh, you righteous and give thanks to his holy name. The right response to the sovereignty of God is worship, is joy. We rejoice in Him. We rejoice because in Him He is the culmination of all things. We we read Daniel four. You know He's going to do whatever He wants, but Daniel seven, chapter four or chapter seven, verse fourteen, it speaks of His eternal kingdom, right? And to Him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. This everlasting kingdom is fulfilled in Christ himself. And we look forward to and long for that day as his people. Don't you? <laughs> you, you, you say, Maranatha, Lord, come. Lord, come. How long, O oh Lord, shall these things go on? We look forward to the coming of his kingdom and all things being set right. This is a, this is a struggle that we battle with daily, submitting to his, his lordship, his reign, his rule. But as we do, as we do, <laughs> it brings a peace it brings a calm in the midst of the storm. We'll close with just an illustration. Uh, Charles Spurgeon shared of a man named White, Whitelock. He was traveling from England to Sweden. He was an, he was an envoy uh, for the government, and he was, as they were on the boat, he was so overwhelmed with the status of you know, the business he was taking. It, it, it was not good. It was a bad situation, and, and he couldn't sleep. He was just, he was wrestling. And, you, ever, you ever been there? You lay on your bed at night, you just can't sleep because this is going on and this is going on. And you have these problems, you have this problem. And there's his assistant beside him in the bunk next, next to him. And his assistant says, sir, may I ask you a question? He says, of course. He says, sir, do you think God governed the world very well before you came into it? He said, undoubtedly. He said, do you think that he will govern it quite as well when you're going out of it? 
Certainly. He said, then, sir, excuse me, but do you not think you may trust him to govern it quite as well while you are living? And he had no answer. He just rolled over and went to sleep. (laughs) Why? Because God's in control. He's in control. And we can rest in that. Let's close in prayer. Father, we.